Um, hi, uh, welcome to machine design. Um, you know, this, this whole distance learning thing is, uh, is uncomfortable, so I just wanted to get close um, so that you know I'm there for you. Um, it's hard times we're living in, in the era of Rona, so um, just uh, just know I'm here for you, okay? Um, and, uh, yeah. I didn't put on enough makeup today for a close-up. I didn't put on enough makeup at all for waking up. But I still look like this. Okay. Um, so in the last lecture, we discussed degrees of freedom. Uh, the, the idea behind degrees of freedom is uh, that it's the amount of independent movements you have in a system. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is something called a four-bar linkage. Uh, we'll get to four-bar linkage, and then at the very end of this video, uh, we'll cover cams, which cams um, suck. <laughs> I hate cams, really do. Um, the idea behind a four bar linkage is, uh, I didn't get time to go through it in the last video, but if you calculate the number of degrees of freedom of a system, a uh, four bar linkage ends up having exactly one degree of freedom. Wow, I cannot draw all of a sudden. And I guess it's not all of a sudden. Okay. This is a one degree of freedom system comprised of four connected members um, that are all simple links okay by a simple links means two joints two revolution revolute joints okay so each joint has two revolution joints now you say well there's only three well technically well if we wanted to build this system we could replace the ground linkage with one single simple joint that connects this to this. So basically what we end up with is you got one of these, you got one of these, you got one of these, and then you got one of these. Okay, that's the same thing. The only difference is that we're taking this linkage and we're making it fixed. It doesn't move. So that's what a four bar linkage is. One of the linkages is ground. In a four bar linkage though, it is imperative that all of your linkages are simple. Simple links, which means two revolute joints a piece. As soon as you start adding a third revolute joint, as soon as you start connecting this piece to ground, uh, your system doesn't move anymore. It, it can't. So it is important that you have two revolute joints. Now, there are five bar and six bar linkages, variations of this, uh, that do allow for uh, more than just simple links, but this is a four bar linkage. Four bar linkages comprised of simple links, each with two uh, revolute joints. Now, you may also have uh, uh, a sliding joint, It says siding, uh, but that would be one entire component. We'll talk about that, okay? So for the four bar linkages, let's talk about some terminology, okay? The shortest member of a four bar linkage usually is capable of going all the way around in a full 360 degree 
um, rotation. Okay, it's small enough that we can take this component and spin it all the way around its ground connection. Um, you can do that in this linkage. It's, it's possible, it's fully possible. This component moves a little bit back and forth. This one goes all the way around 360 degrees. Uh, your shortest member can be a crank, okay? So this one can be a crank. Crank means it can go can rotate about one of its joints. Okay? Now we're looking over here at this joint. This joint is opposite this simple joint. Um, and we're going to go ahead and call that a rocker. And a rocker is a linkage typically connected to ground. Or your fixed link. That rotates through a region of angles. Like, for example, we can say if we define this as zero degrees, maybe it goes between 70 degrees. Whoop, that was not 70. Maybe it goes between 70 degrees and when it rotates all the way this direction, uh, maybe it's 110 degrees. Okay, so it has two different regions that it can rotate through and it, and it can assume any angle as long as that angle is between 70 degrees and 110 degrees. Okay, so that, that makes it a rocker. Typically, your longest member can be a rocker as long as it's connected to ground. Okay, so you look at your two joints connected to ground here, one is a crank, one is a, a rocker. Now, that doesn't necessarily come out as true. It turns out you have to classify your linkages, okay? Um, because there is a linkage called a double rocker. In a double rocker system, you have your two joints connected to ground that are long like this. And you have a really short linkage right here in the middle. And the way that this rocks back and forth is going to cause this thing to spin 360 degrees. Well, this isn't even connected to the ground. So it's not really a crank. Because it, this one does also have to be connected to the ground. And both of these are rockers. No, ah, what's going on here? Well, four bar linkages are extraordinarily versatile. Because it turns out, uh, the beauty of having a four bar linkage is that four bar linkages allow for multiple different types uh, of movement to be used. So, why have four bar linkages? Okay. Um, I have a few more definitions to get through on four bar linkages. Just hold off on me. Okay, we'll get there. I should have said that right now. I am giving you a very disorganized lecture. I apologize. Uh, I just really love this topic. <laughs> um, they're versatile. They allow you to have a number of, of connection joints. They give you different types of motion. Uh, they transfer power. Uh, they're actually one of the most common types of power transfer mechanisms because they have some very unique properties, uh, which I'll try to get to towards the end of this video. Okay, um, they transfer power remarkably, uh, versatile, um, and plus they're, they're really simple to build. Okay, 
this is just, it's just plain steel. You, you could take the popsicle stick with a couple of bolts in them and you can create a four bar linkage like this. It's really not hard. So that's the beauty of a four bar linkage. I mean, made out of anything, it's just flat stuff with bolts in them, or tubes, or pencils, anything that comprises a revolute joint. Okay? So, when we go to build them, they have a lot of properties that are really nice for us as a designer. Um, now, that said, they can be really complex to analyze kinematically. Uh, so, we need to get down what are the components for a four bar linkage, okay? So, I guess I should give you my better list of definitions now. Definitions. Okay, your input link. Is a link connected to an actuator. Okay, or it could be a link connected to another link that is inputting power. Uh, no matter what, the input link is is where the power comes into the four bar linkage. Okay, you got your output link. This is the link connected to the output. I mean, no surprise. Um, sometimes the output is uh, like for, for your vehicle hatch, um, your output is the hatch and it's the movement of the hatch. Okay, a fixed link. Uh, this is usually a ground link, uh, but really it's it's a link that all of your other motions are measured relative to. Okay, we measure all of our motions relative to the ground because the ground doesn't move. Um, but but in a linkage that is a fixed link, you measure all of your movements relative to that whatever that fixed link is. Okay, and then you have your coupling link, or your coupler, and what that coupler does is it is the link connecting input and output links. Okay, so the input and output link have one connection to the fixed link and one connection to the coupling link. That's how it works. Okay, um, now based on how we configure this, we can have a number of different types of systems. Um, as we talked about earlier, your shortest link can be a crank, your longest link can be a rocker, um, all of those types of things. Um, I mean, we can talk about crank, you just bring in the definition I just gave you, rocker, also bring in the definition I gave you, um, cranks and rockers. Uh, are either your input or output links. For, uh, for a motor, uh, what you have is your piston system. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention slider. Okay, so the two definitions I gave you. Um, oh, we'll just give it to you again. A crank is... an input or output link that rotates 360 degrees about fixed link. Okay. A rocker is an input or output link that has uh, a restricted angular rotation range. Okay, and a slider is a 
link that has linear, well it's an input or output link. Again, these three are input or output links. An input slash output link that has linear motion. Okay. Um, in a piston system, you have a slider as one as the input linkage and a crank as the output linkage. And that's what causes uh, the rotation in an engine. Okay. Uh, in a lot of systems, like for your, you know, let's say, um, well, for some systems, you want to have a crank rocker system, a crank moves to a certain angle, it causes the rocker to rotate to a different angle. It's just power transmission um, capabilities. But we can classify a number of different systems based on the lengths of these linkages. Um, if you have, um, well, I guess we'll get into that. Does my four bar linkage exist? Well, um, that is actually a concern because you can design a system where a four bar linkage does, it's physically geometrically impossible uh, to create that four bar linkage, okay? If you take one link that looks like this and your other three links are this long, well, that's not a four bar linkage because there's no way to connect this here, connect this here, and then have those meet in the middle. It can't happen. Okay? So how do we how do we define whether or not there is an existence of a four bar linkage? Well, this is where uh, you use something called a uh, Grashoff uh, condition for four bar linkages. Um, and what it is, is we look at whatever the shortest link is, whatever the longest link is, and then whatever the other two linkages are, which are the intermediate links, and you say shortest link plus longest link, and the condition is that this has to be less than or equal to the length of the other two linkages. Okay, so S here is um, the shortest link and it represents a distance uh, between the two joints that define that linkage. Okay, L is your longest link, and P and Q, uh, intermediate link lengths. Okay, so let's say I've got a system where I've got a rocker, I've got a crank, and I have fixed system here. Okay, the distance between these two joints. Doop, 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 doop. Uh, let's say this is uh, my ground link or my fixed link. Uh, we'll say that's 36 inches. Okay, we'll say this here is 18 inches, and this is my rocker. And we'll say this is my output link. Uh, we'll say my coupler is uh, 20 inches. And we'll say uh, that my crank input link is um, six inches. Okay, so the question is, is does this system exist? Is it possible to construct this system or are we going to have that deal where we have one link that's so long that the other three links can't make it? And looking at that, we're going to add these two together and add those two together. So our longest link here, L, is 36. Uh, short is 6 inches. And then our P and Q are 18 and 20. So if you add these two together, this equals 
38. If you add these two together, it equals 42. So does this exist? No. It can't exist. You can't actually physically connect this system. And if you think, if you think about it, um, having six inches like this, yeah, you won't, you won't actually be able to get a movement out of that system. Because these three links alone are required to span the ground link. What you end up with in this type of a system is this is not actually going to rotate 360 degrees. It's going to go like this. You'll have a little bit of movement in the system, but it's not going to fully rotate. Okay? Um, so, Grashoff, this is called the Grashoff condition. Um, this dictates whether or not our system is capable of moving. Okay? Um, and there are a number of other conditions where this doesn't produce a crank uh, rocker system. This produces a rocker rocker system because it violates the Grashoff uh, condition. Um, if we were to change this and say instead of using a 20 inch coupler, use a 30 inch coupler, uh, now this system would allow the crank to go 360 degrees. Okay, and then it becomes a crank rocker system. Uh, where this one moves back and forth, and this one moves 360 degrees. Um, that kind of a thing. So, you can also have a double crank system. A double crank system happens when you have your, your shortest link, you have two of them that are identical lengths. So if this one also would have been 6 inches, uh, and this one would have been 36 inches, uh, what happens is this whole thing rotates like this. <laughs> it's called a double a double crank system. Um, so there, there's a number of interesting ways you can configure your linkages to get different kinds of outputs. I um, guess I'm not really going to go too terribly in depth into this right now, uh, but we are going to be discussing this more in class uh, this week because you more than likely are going to need to understand these principles to design your robotic leg for this class. Um, so, this isn't the last time you've seen this. Or you will see this. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to cams quickly. Uh, FYI, actually, before I move on to cams, um, the kinematics of a four bar linkage system are really complex and it's challenging to be able to design a four bar linkage system. So, what you end up having to do, and what I would suggest you do, is use SolidWorks. You can build a four bar linkage system in SolidWorks, create a ground link as your fixed link, and then see how having an input link, how it affects the output link, and so on and so forth. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in class. But. Now let's talk about cams. Okay. Um, cams are, what they are, it, it's a profile of a rotational member. Um, with distinctive rises and falls. Okay, the camshaft in your vehicle has cams that look like this. Okay, and what happens is uh, you have a follower. A follower is basically like a little wheel that sits on this. And as this cam moves, that follower experiences some kind of behavior. Okay, um, if you rotate this upward, uh, obviously with this hump, it's going to push this follower upward because um, this follower is probably connected to a spring that pushes it down. Uh, this is how valves work on your car. Your, your camshafts affect valving. Uh, as this rotates upward, pushes this upward, it would open a valve. 
goes back down, closes the valve. Okay. Um, the way that cams work are that you have some kind of a profile that spins around a central axis. And for a lot of that rotation, if I take this and I rotate it 90 degrees, you'll see this follower doesn't move. And then I rotate it another 90 degrees. And again, this follower doesn't move. And then I rotate it another 90 degrees. And suddenly, this follower moves. So the way that, the nice thing about cams is that cams can give you a very interesting profile of movement for your follower. Okay, cams and followers together Okay, it usually produces some kind of a linear movement, but you can also put it on a follower uh, that causes an angular movement instead. Um, but it takes a rotational input, uh, and with the follower, it creates a different kind of output. Uh, it's just an energy transformation. Okay, if you have a certain amount of power that's going into this, um, your power is, is going to be most substantially used when you're actually moving your follower. It's, it's not going to do anything when your follower is not moving. Um, all the power that you're plugging into the system between here and here goes straight into heat. And here, it actually goes into mechanical power transfer. Okay, um, so that is, that is ultimately what a cam is. Now, the way that people design cams are you have something called a cam profile. Okay, when it comes to actually designing a cam, um, what you want to do is you want to say, you know, get into that leader mindset. What do you want your follower to do? Okay, if you were to plot out with time, uh, your follower Y movement, uh, if you want it to look like this, that's an easy profile to do. Because what you end up doing is you say, okay, I want to map this change that, you know, if let's say that this just continues repeating indefinitely. Okay, I want to take one cycle of this and I want to map that to my cam. Okay, when you do that, you say, okay, the rotational distance around my uh, cam is going to equal this. And what you end up resulting with that is, okay, if, if this is a graph of my, uh, uh, the radius of my cam from the center, let's see, it's, it's constant for a little bit. And then it increases, decreases, and then it's constant again. That's what it looks like. And this is the cam that gets produced. You take your y of t, you transform it to now, this is an r theta. And your r theta looks like this. With a rotation of your cam, you get a different radius. And that different radius looks exactly like this and it produces this kind of a movement out of your follower and this becomes repetitive because as theta reaches 360 degrees this whole thing starts over again so this is the fundamentals behind how to design a cam um, and how cams work uh, as i said we're going to talk about four bar linkages a little bit more in class this week um, for homework for this material, I'm going to be giving you uh, a design. I'm going to probably be giving you two design problems. Um, and I'm going to want to cover a lot more design problems as we move through the semester. Uh, but we're also going to be discussing the project, getting started on the project, uh, because really this is the content that gets into design.
and how do we take these components and do something with them. So I will see you this week. Um, live long and prosper. Um, I love you. Um, rock on. Um, 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 baby shark. Do do do.